All right, thank you everyone for joining uh, this week's webinar. I am uh, beyond excited to be with Karen Mitchell from uh, Simply Floors. Karen, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me, Todd. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm very excited to chat. I know we've done this chat a few times and every time right. the internet went down. Mm -hmm. So um, you were willing to do this from your house today. So we actually had internet. So yep. I, uh, I appreciate that. Sure. Um, I think last year I, I referred to you as I think the lead queen or the lead legend or something, the, the queen of RLM, which, you know, Broadloom lead management at right. this point. But um, I want to take one step back and everyone listening, let's first talk about Simply Floors. Um, sure. Who you guys are, you know, give us the background on Simply Floors and then we'll dive into lead management a bit. Sure. Um, about uh, in two, Simply Floors started in 2014. And prior to that, um, my husband had been a general contractor all the way up through about 2010. And we actually went broke. And so at the time I was working in healthcare, I'm a um, licensed physical therapist and I went back to work full time because I'd previously been staying home. Well, partially staying home, not full time, but I'd been working only part time because um, my kids were kind of little. And so um, he got a job with another flooring company and that went along for just under two years. And then he realized that he was the top salesperson in a nationwide company and we still weren't making it so that there was something wrong with that picture. So he decided to start his own flooring company. And at the time, I wasn't necessarily going to leave my job like I was going to stick with my career. Um, so he had a business partner, somebody who had money. We didn't. Um, and so he joined with this business partner and it was pretty quickly apparent within the first year that they, we were not a good fit. And so it took another year to disentangle that partnership. Um, but we did. And then at that point I decided to leave my career and go into full time and with buddy into simply floors. Okay. So from physical therapy to flooring, kind of the same therapy. Oh, you know, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to rehab your on. house, rehab a person, you know, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of the similar. Um, I, I want to hit on, on one thing. I mean, there's kind of a resilience thing there. You said straight up going broke to oh, yeah. now. I don't, you know, maybe you could tell the walk through the trajectory, like going broke to um, building this thing with the wrong partner, then you coming in, so now you guys do some amount of money, just like what is the resilience there and where have you gone from broke to where are you guys at today in 2021, 2022? Um, you know, there's a resilience there because I think when really tough things happen, you can either learn from it and move forward or you can crash and burn. And we definitely had some times we were definitely crash and burn for a little bit, but um Buddy had actually decided he was never, ever going to own another business. Like he was completely crashed and burned. And it's a really, really tough thing mentally to go broke. Um, probably more, maybe more so for men than women. I don't know. But in that, in his case, I mean, it was just really, really tough mentally. And so um, he needed that period of time to work for somebody else. But then when he kept seeing, you know what, they're not like, this isn't good. And this isn't good. And this isn't good. So when we made the decision to go out on our own again, we determined that we were going to learn from a lot of our mistakes and um, move forward from them and do things differently. And is there one big takeaway there before we dive into everything? One big takeaway that you learn? I mean, you have to crash and burn to learn everything. So what is the number one takeaway? Then let's get into kind of the meat here. Don't repeat your mistakes. Yeah, they're lessons. Figure out what they are, because if you can't figure out what they are, you're going to repeat them. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. And now, so you guys have grown the business. How big of a business is it today? What does the business look like today? Um, I think it's going to be about seven and a half to eight million this year. I mean, it's been a little bit of a flat year. We had hoped to grow. We had some projections, like we had some goals to grow, but it's been a little flat. So um, I'm not sure that we'll grow this year. It's a, a tough year for everyone. Let's let's yeah. call it. Um yeah. Okay. So up to seven and a half million and you guys have changed a lot. You have a lot of processes, a lot of things, but the, I think the topic for today is lead management. Um, sure. There's a lot of people out there that don't manage their leads or they just get form fills or phone calls and, you know, they go figure it out. What, yeah. what were you doing before Broadloom lead management previously RLM, I, you know, let's throw mm -hmm. it out there. Uh, what were we doing before Broadloom lead management? And what was the moment where you were like, we need, we need lead management. Like we can't live without it. 
Yeah, well, so when it was just Buddy and myself, it was not terribly difficult to manage the processes because we were a lot smaller. So, um, you know, if I'm doing half of the business work and my jobs are defined and he's doing this half of the business work and his jobs are defined, then that's kind of easy. But then we started growing and it was too much work for the two of us. And so, um, you know, he went out and sold and sold and sold and I did everything else. Like I did all the ordering, all the scheduling, all the, the you know, he would yeah. call usually and schedule the jobs and he'd communicate with the installers and things like that. But when we realized it was outgrowing us, we started well, having to add people. Where was he keeping track of all of that during that time? Um, he wasn't great at it because he's not the detail person. So sometimes it was in his head. And sometimes it was in notes, like a notebook in his car, but he was driving around because everything was shop at home. So, you know, that's not a great, for people who need help organizing things, like need help staying organized um, and are not detailed people, that mobile thing is really, really tough because yeah. you always have things falling on the floor of your car. Maybe you got a notebook where you jotted it down. Maybe you left it at a customer's house, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. it was challenging. And so I just started making like, filing systems in my computer and we had, you know, electronic, um, you know, estimates instead of paper ones. Like we just made little changes to streamline stuff. So I basically was sitting at home kind of managing all the details and he was out trying to generate income. Okay. So at some point you realized that wasn't going to, to work. Listen, I can't remember a lot of times what I had for lunch yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can, for some reason, remember a lot of like business conversations, mm -hmm. but like, if you were to ask me, Mrs. Jones, what conversation did we have about the specific carpet you were looking for? Like, I don't think I could remember. Unless you have a photographic memory, I got to be honest, I don't know how you don't use a CRM or a spreadsheet. Yeah, I or agree. Something. Yeah. Um, and we had spreadsheets. Like, I would create Excel sheets to track, like, our builder jobs, you know, because we got them on timelines and stuff. So we had, like, and I'm not very good at Excel. I mean, you can ask Patrick. I hate, I kind of hate Excel, but I can do the basic stuff. And so we would create these Excel spreadsheets and we would have dates and I'd have to check it every day and like, okay, which date is coming up next? And you know, which one we got to do. So there was a lot of like kind of cobbling things together that we were trying to do um, over time. And the processes part, you know, we were in business for four years before we got RLM. And so we had put these different processes in place, just using like, computer tools that we already had, you know, Microsoft Office yeah. and things like that. So, um, and as we started adding people, we had to, we had to develop policies and procedures because we realized that we want things to happen a certain way in our business. And unless we have a policy or a procedure for it, if other people aren't going to know that. Yeah. Yeah. How can they expect to, how, yeah, I think you said something to me really interesting before, which was if we're all rowing a boat, but you're not telling them which way to row, everyone just row in a different direction. You're just staying in the mm -hmm. same you're just mm -hmm. spinning in the same circle. Yeah. Or um, pulling a, or pulling a wagon or something like that. Like, you know, everybody saw the queen die last, a couple weeks ago, right. Yeah. And watch the funeral and those soldiers carrying that gun cart with those big long ropes. If you looked at them, I don't know if anybody watched on TV, but I did. Cause I just got back from London the day before. So, um, and I was like jet lagged. No, so you, you were, you were impressed by the process and procedures is what you were I was about. because those soldiers are walking in lockstep. And they all are pulling that rope and that car did not waver. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I mean, that's efficiency saved and that's just getting everyone on the same, mm -hmm. on the same, you know, the same timeline, the same everything. Yeah. So let's, so you know, if we really look at lead management, there's a few things I want to hit on first. I hear questions all the time of like, why do I need to manage my leads? Um, I have a lot of answers to that. Uh, mm -hmm. But how would you answer that? Like, what are the real benefits of lead management? I want to say something out loud just up front here. Like, we don't do a good job selling lead management. Why? Because it's like it's $19 a seat. Like, it's not like we're making a ton and of money. 20 now, any, Todd, didn't you have a huge price uh, increase? It's 20, yeah, or 18. <laughs> I actually think, I think it went from 16 to 19 or something. I don't even know what it is. But yeah. uh, it's not a lot of money. So it's probably our right. fault that many, more people aren't using it. So I don't want right. this to come off as a sales pitch. But I do think going into a recession... You, we need to do anything we can to get as much business as possible. And if you're a leaky bucket of leads, you are less yeah. likely to be successful. And that's my answer. But what yeah. are you, when someone asks you, why should I, what are the benefits of actually managing my leads or specifically, you know, the broader lead management system? What mm -hmm. would you, what do you say to that? Yeah. So I kind of, 
approached it from the point of view of what happens when you don't manage your leads. And so I, I kind of was thinking of myself, what are problems that business owners come into because they're not managing their leads? And I would ask them, are they putting out a ton of fires every single day? Are they forgetting to call people back? Do they have a process that is consistently followed by everybody in their company? Do their customers know what to expect? When one person answers the phone, are they going to get the same answer from somebody else? And also, how do you do problem solving in your business? And there's more questions that you can go through, but do you have a sales process? Is that well established? And all those things can be solved. I bet you people listening can probably say yes to at least one of those and maybe more. And so one of the th things that it benefits is that you increase your efficiency. You increase your team transparency. It promotes teamwork because everybody can see what anybody else is doing. You get more accuracy with everything that's going on. You have accountability among your team. You have clear expectations among your team. You can set clear expectations with customers because you have a process in place. And I would kind of add to that that I don't think it's enough just to say I'm going to use RLM or lead management but you have to actually put some standardization in place because just using it isn't enough because it's very, very open. It's very customizable and it's super, super flexible. So you can't just say, OK, everybody use this and boom, now we're on the same page. You have to have some kind of consistency and standard of process in there. So yeah. and, and I, I think we're yeah. going to talk about that. I guess I want to dive into one part of that, which is also let's say you're on vacation. Like you, you have a few, you know, you go on vacation. I think you're going down to South Carolina or something in a week. And like, mm -hmm. how are you able to check in on your business if you yeah. don't have the ability to look at your leads? Well, that was my last point that I was actually about to say. And the point is, is that you have happier employees and you have a better work-life balance. Because if you are on a vacation and we have the salespeople that take vacation, somebody was going to be out in another week. And if your customer calls and we don't have access to your information, we have to call you when you're on vacation. Nobody wants to work while they're on vacation. And those of us that are business owners and heads of companies, like we know that there's an expectation that sometimes we take those calls, right? Because the buck stops with us. I mean, I know you take calls when you're out and about and, and I do too, if, if it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. But the point is, is that we will all burn out if we don't have some work-life balance. And if you don't put some boundaries in place, but the only way you can be a team and have your team help you while you're out is to have proper documentation and proper procedures, because I never have to call, you know, one of my sales staff was off for her birthday this weekend. She was up in the mountains. She had friends coming in from out of state for her, for her birthday. She was without cell service and really couldn't answer calls. And she's one that I actually have to say, Kristen, ignore your email while you're gone. Like, okay, yeah. you're going to get emails. Just ignore it. You, you got to turn it off. You cannot answer them. We were able to handle everything that came in for her while she was gone with absolutely no problems because she had everything in there. Or, I mean, vacation, forget that. That's an easy thing. How about if someone leaves, mm -hmm. right? Imagine someone that's working 30, sure. 30 leads or so, and they just decide to for sure. quit. Like, for sure. Then what? For sure. You know? And we've had that happen as well. That's, that's a, it, these are not unusual situations that owners get into at all. Yeah. They're common. And I even say at a higher level, like when I'm talking to a lot of retailers that want to sell their business. And I'm saying, well, what are you selling? And they say, oh, well, we have a great brand name. And oh, uh, this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you have no process. You're just you mm -hmm. running around. And your mm -hmm. customer records are where? Oh, we don't have them. And I'm like, mm -hmm. if I want to buy the business, I need process. I need procedures. I need a scalable solution. And I need customer records so I know, oh, these people could be repeat. Yeah. Oh, this person's bought for you. But you have none of that? Then what are you selling? Well, You're selling nothing. And let me give you a, a little bit of a sobering story to that. We know somebody and I'm going to be very careful about what I say, but we know somebody who um, the business owner suddenly died. And um, I mean, it was extremely sudden, wasn't even sick. And now the wife is left with what to do with the business. And she wants to sell it because she needs money. She's got nothing to sell. Yeah. Nothing. Because yeah. he's gone and there were no procedures, no business, no, nothing. His business was him. And you can't, you can't expect to have some, something of value when you don't have any processes, no documentation, no structure. It's just not there. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a, I don't want to call it, it's a sobering example, but it, it was just, very sobering. And it really hit Buddy hard because this guy wasn't too much older than him. Yeah. 
no, it, it, it totally makes sense. So I, the moral of that is enjoy every day, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, um, make sure you have systems in place. So, so mm -hmm. th the next question I hear is like, well, it's daunting. I'm so busy. It's daunting. Yeah. And getting my staff, well, my staff is you, this is what I hear. My staff is unique. You have to understand, mm -hmm. like they hate yep. technology and, and my mom yep. works there and that yep. it'll just never work. It works for Karen, but like it, it yep. just doesn't work for me. How do you guys onboard and train and more so i guess than that how do you enforce this policy because supposedly everyone else's team is different than your team i guess yeah i mean i think that you have to truthfully i think you got to step back unfortunately and you kind of have to look at your team structure before rlm because the idea is is if you're already in a situation where everybody is just doing whatever they want to do in your company then you have a more root problem, in my opinion, than just onboarding lead management. So you have to have some clear um, expectations of who's in charge, who's your direct report, how your company is set up. You know, does everybody know what you're what you're shooting for? Do you have a mission statement? Do you have core values? I mean, Jason touched on some of that in the boot camp, and I think that is really crucial to get some of those basic things about your company set up. Because once you have established that, even if you don't have processes in place, you say, OK, you now have a trust position with your employees and your team saying we have investigated this and we have decided that this is going to move our business forward and we want everybody on board. And so you've got to obviously convince people as much as you can. And if they cannot be convinced, I mean, and I'm not saying, you know, some people have heard me say, hey, if you don't do RLM, you don't work for us, which is technically true. But I don't mean that in a really um, rude or snarky way. I mean, we're going to do everything we can to convince them to be part of this process and see the value of it. So, I mean, if, if they're absolutely refusing after that, then it's 100 percent true. This is part of our process, just like any other process in our company. And if you're not willing to do it, then you're not part of the team. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in charge, right? Like, that's the other thing is like, who's in charge? Like, I think we've gotten to the point where... I know there's a lack of people that want to work, but mm -hmm. you are in charge. You, yeah. Your employees or your salesperson is not telling yeah. you how to run the business. Well, and to be honest, I'm paying my sales staff really well. And we expect a lot out of them for what we pay them. And so there is absolutely no reason why they cannot follow this process. And, you know, I tell the story of the person who was our top salesperson at the time that we took on RLM and she was really our golden girl and everybody in the office knew it. And so she was kind of grumbling and mumbling because she was saying in behind the scenes, not straight to our face, but saying that I don't think I want to do this. This is just going to take too much time. It's going to take away from my sales time. Her sales went from like, um, I think it was 850,000 a year up to one and a half million or something like that. Like her sales jumped like 40 or $50,000 a month within three months. So she, she got it. I mean, she was more efficient. She didn't forget things. She had things documented and she was an excellent salesperson. I mean, she'd still be working for us if she hadn't moved across the country. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure she got way more efficient. So how do you onboard people like her? What is the onboarding like for you guys, new employees kind of getting Yeah, I'm doing it right now. I have somebody that's been with us less than two weeks. And um, first of all, we have them watch videos with RLM, the ones that are posted, the general ones. Yep. And then we explain that we have a customization of these videos. So they get an overview first. And then we start going through the processes um, a little at a time. And really, um, the bottom line is they have to just get in there and do it. And then the person who's training or helping them has to be spot checking and making sure that things are being followed correctly. So for instance, with this new person, we always start a sales trainee answering the phones to some degree so that they get a lot of experience answering questions and things. And so when they get the leads in, guess who gets to put them in every single time is the trainee because they have yeah. to practice and watching it on a video isn't really going to do it. They have to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. Totally makes sense. So you do videos, they practice, they spot yep. check. And then how about like, okay, they're up and running and, you know, kind of ready to go. What do they revert back to? I know you're big into flow charts and mm -hmm. written kind of visual things like yeah what type we of have flow charts for all of our processes and so they're expected to use those as resources they know where they are they know where they can find them if they don't know exactly how to do something then they go back to their reference sheets and i'm always help willing to help somebody like figure it out but sometimes after a while if they've asked the same question over and over i'm like go look at your book first and then come back and tell me if you can't find it 
Yeah, um, and here's the thing. You said two things there. You also pay people well. So like you probably get the best talent by paying 5% more or 10% more. Possibly. Um, but you all like you're doing this because you think it'll allow them to make sell more so that they can make more money. Mm -hmm. And if, as long as they understand the intent, you know, you would hope there's never any pushback of like the purpose and reason we're doing this. And if it doesn't help you sell more, we won't use it. But you've it's obviously right. proven to help you sell more, right. which is why you're doing it. Yeah, exactly. And we have like we've set some minimum standards and minimum expectations. And you, you, if you're familiar with lead management, you know that there's a whole bunch of stages. You can set up a million of them if you want to. Um, yeah. I suggest they keep it simple, as simple as, as possible. But um, I have minimum stages that every salesperson is expected to do. Now, they can do more than that, but they have to do the minimum. And there's certain things that they have to do in order to turn in a job. And they're written out. You know, they know. They know what they have to do. And if they don't know, they're learning. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree. And it's about the commitment and time that you. Yeah. Practice is really the big thing. Practical practice. Like it's one thing to show them everything that they have to do, but they really have to get in there and practice. So literally we just start giving them leads and start walking them through the process. And how much, not to take this aside, but I know you're also onboarding or onboarded, or I don't know what you call it on with role math, Broadloom ERP, role yeah. master, Broadloom ERP. Mm -hmm. Do you envision the same procedure? Do you envision the same, all of this that you're going to do for your current employees? For role master ERP. processes? Um, yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. And probably it's because I'm not 100% up there on the processes. Go. It's really difficult. You have to basically be the one that knows everything when you're writing the processes. So it yeah. may not be the same person in every company that's doing everything. I am currently probably the one that knows the most about the role master processes. But that's a little bit different animal because there's so many different ways to do things in, yeah. in Role Master. And I'm still tearing my hair out on a few of those myself. So um, that's another conversation. But um, anyway, I mean, yes, we have some processes that for sure. But really, we use lead management in tandem with Role Master. I remember a couple of years ago when people were asking me why we have all these expensive pro expansive processes in RLM because I didn't have an ERP at the time. I was using QuickBooks and they're like, oh, she only has to do it that way because she doesn't have the ERP. Now that I have an ERP, I 100% disagree with them because the ERP does not do the tasks, the who's, who's next on this list, who takes this part yeah. of this project over. I have to use them both together and in no way has my ERP substituted for RLM. Like, I can't even think of one place where it has. Yeah, one is very specifically lead management, and one's everything after that you close yeah. the lead, right? Like, yeah, th because I manage everything point. from the sale all the way to the like the thank you card at the end. And people are like, "Oh, you don't really need to do that if you have an ERP." Oh, yes, you do. So, do you send? Are your thank you cards actually handwritten, or do you use one of those services that like we use a service? Them? Yeah, nah. we use a service. I mean, yeah, sales I, staff have talked about whether or not they're going to start writing hand hand done cards, but you know, nobody has time for that at an eight million dollar volume. And now yeah. that we're lower, we actually have talked about what can we do to like pick up the referrals and stuff like that. And and we've talked about that, so it's not off the table by any means. But we do have a service, and we have a girl in the office that does it. Well, and to get over the eight million mark, I know you guys are opening ground or opening up a second showroom, mm -hmm. so that should help. Displays you are supposed to be delivered today, and the truck is late. <laughs> Welcome to the flooring industry, I guess. Um, okay, so I want to hit the last part here, which is um, standards, right? So we've kind of talked about why you do it. We talked about onboarding. We kind of talked a bit about training. But again, it's what are your standards within RLM? Like, what are the big, do you have any tips and tricks? And again, I, I think it's like, Everyone can use RLM differently. So if you don't yeah. get your standards, you're everybody can use RLM differently. And my tagline to my team is that if it is not documented in RLM, it does not exist. You didn't do it. I don't care if you said you called that customer. If you didn't document in RLM for all intents and purposes, you never called them. Because yeah. the biggest problems that we have, and when we end up having to put out fires, not always, but when mostly the time when we end up having to put out a fire, it's because somebody did not document something in RLM that they should have. We can problem solve, and I alluded to this earlier, we can problem solve if we have the facts. But if you do not have the facts and a problem arises, how do you solve that problem? Problem solving, in my opinion, involves 
gathering the facts, figuring out what's real, taking things one step at a time, figuring out what the, the actual problem is. And if the facts are not there, you cannot solve the problem. You have to spend time finding out the information instead. Yep. And doing things consistently over mm -hmm. and over. And I can imagine like someone enters it in one way versus another way, or mm -hmm. someone uses it one way versus another way, or yep. someone uses a certain stage versus another stage. That's why the processes are so important because everybody has to know. I have a definition sheet and all of my staff, I tell them right up front, in fact, the first day I do orientation, I say, these three pages are the most important part for you to learn in RLM. And you can't work here if you don't know these things. These are essential yep. to your job. Yeah, I'm actually curious. So every morning, what's your process? And if you want, share your screen or if not, feel free. But every morning, what should an owner, let's say they have RLM set up the way you do. You mm -hmm. wake up in the morning, you check RLM to gut check what's going on in the business. What are you, what are you doing? What's yeah. like your, your I don't do it every single day for every single person because I certainly know that some people are more consistent than others, but it, when we get a problem call or something, then I'll be like, hmm, maybe I better spot check that. What usually happens, and I require everybody to have three tabs open at every at any time. One is their task screen, one is their open lead screen, and one is an all lead screen. And so the re, and especially if they're office based, not so much if they're mobile, but um, everybody's required to check their task list at the beginning of the day, and then they need to leave 20 or 30 minutes at the end of the day before they sign off for the day to check their task screen again. And that's because you could get things added to your tasks that you haven't seen yet. Um, and you might have to do something before you leave, you know, or maybe you forgot a task and you've got to send an email before you leave or something like that. So um, that's the basics of it. Um, if I need to go help somebody at the office and they say, hey, can you come help me with this job? I expect to walk over to their computer and have the correct screens open because I don't want to stand there and wait for them to, oh, sorry, I didn't have the right screen open. Now we got to spend, you know, another 60 seconds opening the screen. It's like, if you can yeah. ask me for help, have it open. So, so what's the purpose of having the all lead screen open for them just in case they get assigned something? Um, the all lead screen is mostly for those working in the office. And that's because if we get a phone call or a problem that pops up and you don't know for sure right off the top, especially if you're when they answer the phone, if it's an open or a closed lead. Yeah. So if you get a call and you have open lead screen and they say, oh, well, we're installing next week and I have some questions. Well, that's obvious. You know, it's an open lead because it's not done. But we get a lot of calls and they give their name and they ask to speak to somebody and you have no idea. So you need an all lead screen open because you got to search and figure out, are they open or are they closed? What's the situation on this? I mean, sometimes they'll make it sound like you installed them last week and you actually installed them two years ago, you know? Yeah. And so you, you don't know that unless you're looking at the lead when you're on the phone with them. Yep. 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 Totally agree. And putting in um, things that avoids duplications too. Yeah. And if there's, du yeah, if there's duplications, then you're just running all over and you look not professional and the chances your, your close rate isn't high. And I know you guys pride yourselves on your close rate. I mean, I, I hear from retailers all the time, more leads, more leads, more leads. And I, I do the math. I'm saying, all right, let's say you have a hundred leads and your close rate is 10%. You could go to 200 leads, but you're going to get 20 jobs, not 10 jobs. Why don't you just increase your close rate from 10% mm -hmm. to 40%. Yeah. And that's why buddy's always been big on the quality of leads versus the quantity. And that's why, as you know, we've had those discussions about getting rid of the junkie form fills that I don't like because we really want quality, not quantity. Well, yes. So quality leads, obviously, uh, but you guys also are not a leaky bucket of leads. If you let 5% of those just leak out and you don't manage them properly, well, you're not really getting a hundred leads. You're really getting Correct. 95 leads and Correct. you know, Leaky right. uh, top funnel leaky bucket is just the worst. I mean, it just funnels down all the way. And, if and in my opinion, problem, if you don't have a system to manage it, you're going to leak no, no matter what. And this is so cheap. I mean, come on, people. It's seriously, it's not that much money. Even for people that want to spend thousands and thousands on an ERP or something like that. This is really not that much money. If you aren't getting, let's say the average store needs three licenses. So let's just call it 60 bucks. Although I think it's $57. You're not getting $60 worth of value on it. And I just don't. Yeah. And we have know. 14 users in the system and we pay a little extra for the customer management, which is worth it to yeah. us. So, so uh, whatever that is, 14 times 20, uh, I think we are, I think we pay about 450 a month now. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad it's, it's working for you. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, a few final questions and there's a few questions in the chat. Is there anything that I missed? Um, Anything I missed about lead management, anything that, uh, you know, I skipped over? 
Well, I think that I already mentioned that if it's not in RLM, it's not done. We're really, really big on documenting. We're really, really big on documenting the who, where, when, why, how. And so it's not enough to just say we rescheduled this appointment. You have to say customer called and asked to reschedule because their spouse was sick. Yeah. Because otherwise, you just say you rescheduled. How do I know the salesperson didn't just reschedule because they didn't want to go that day? Interesting. So you make sure they, uh, that's another part of your process and procedures. It's another part of our process and procedure. You're never, ever allowed to change a task or to change a stage without adding a note. Even if there is a mistake, and there are mistakes plenty of times, they're easily fixable. Let's say you put in the wrong stage and have the wrong task. Then I say, okay, you got to fix this or I'll fix it. And you all have all the notes with the wrong task. So all you have to do is say, see previous notes, because it's not that you didn't have to rewrite the note. You don't have to. It's already there. But the point is, you're not just changing it to push it. So we had some people in the very beginning that would just change their due dates because they knew that I had deadlines. So saying mm -hmm. like you can't have past due tasks. And so they just bumped their due dates. And I'm like, that's when I implemented the rule. No changing dates or tasks without a note. You have to tell me why you change that due date. You cannot just change the due date. And if you just you change the due date, then something's wrong. And if people are missing due dates regularly, and I'll spot check every now and then because we have like standards. Um, if I see a bunch of tasks in red, then I know they're getting overwhelmed. And so it's not of come down on them hard. It's like, hey, you look like you're a little overwhelmed. Maybe we need to schedule you some office time to, pick, to catch it up. Yeah. Um, could you imagine just going to a customer and being like, yeah, we're going to push that back. Don't, we're not going to show up on the 14th. We'll show up on the mm -hmm. 20th. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, but that's, that's all comes part down. Of accountability. It's part of accountability. And, and it all comes down to you, though. Like, I just can't stand when people are like, well, I, I my team won't do that. No, it's not your oh, team yeah. won't do it. You won't do it. And you're right. using your team as an excuse. You just need to fire them or tell them they have to do it because you're in charge yeah. and you pay their bills. And, and I, I just like, I'm totally with Jason on the fact that you got to convince them and make them want to do it. But when I say that if you can't do RLM, you can't work here, it's when convincing isn't working. Yeah. Because the bottom line is the buck stops with me. I'm the company owner. I'm the one who's accountable to this customer. I'm the one who's paying the bills when something goes wrong. Yep. So excuse me, but you do what I ask you to do. And you're <laughs> the one that if your company doesn't make money, you're the one that goes broke while they're getting paid, right? I 100%. mean- hundred yeah. percent because you know, when we went broke, we learned a lot of really expensive lessons. And one of them that I, we determined at that time is payroll will always be made and taxes will always be paid. Even if we don't get a check. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And like, what's interesting is you are ultimately as aligned as possible with your salesperson. You want to yes. make as many sales as possible and they want to make as many sales possible to make money. So if you think it's going to work to increase sales, yes. why not have an open mind and try it? Yes. Because you're aligned. And our sales staff are very successful. I mean, if they've been here a year, I cannot think of somebody who's been here a year that is not making over 100000 Wow. I mean, I just yeah, can't I mean, think of anyone. Newer uh, ones, of course not. But nobody who's been here over a year is ever making less than 100000 And in many, most cases, it's much more than 100000 See, Karen even throws in the recruiting in here. So if you're based in the Denver area. You're yeah. going to need more salespeople if yeah. we want to get bigger because yeah. everybody's getting. Okay, the leads have been kind of crazy the last two weeks. We've seen a downturn and then all of a sudden it's going up. And I can say that that's probably because FSU is going on at the moment. <laughs> um, so we're very happy to see that our leads are up. But we literally, if it keeps going at this rate, we won't have enough salespeople to run all the leads. This wasn't a um, an FSU sales Sorry. pitch by any stretch, but I will take <laughs> it, right? A win's a win, um, but I am happy you guys are-, are And we're brand new. Win. Like, it's not like we have like volume to show yet, but the activity yeah. is exciting. Yeah, no, for sure. And that make, it'll make lead management even more. I'm excited to see your new close ratios, I guess. If they were at, what is it, like 70 or 80% before- yeah, I mean, buddy, I'll have to rerun the numbers. I mean, and we had some staff turnover this year. I mean, I'll be completely honest. And it wasn't because leads were down necessarily. They were completely independent reasons for turnovers. And our numbers are not down because staff left. We had plenty of staff to handle what was coming in. Um, it just, we had less, you know, everybody knows inflation. Like our ticket, our ticket items, our average tickets are up, but our numbers of tickets are down. Yeah. So the dollar volume is close to the same as last year at this time. But if it doesn't pick up, then it's not going to be, you know, that kind yep. of thing. And uh, you're going to be speaking at FloorCon this year? 
Uh, yes. Again, for those of you who don't know, though I think everyone knows, FloorCon is November 14th to 16th. You're going to be given a talk similar to this about yeah. lead management, why to use it, process procedures. So if what Karen is saying is overwhelming, well, you have a chance to not just hear it in a hour long setting, but yeah. she's going to be there and she likes to be bothered while she's there. She's promised that <laughs> oh, anyone sure. can come talk to her when, when she's sure. there. Absolutely. Um, I I really am willing to answer questions and help people out. You know, sometimes I don't can't necessarily come sit down and troubleshoot your entire system or anything, but I can certainly give you um, some some tips and tricks. And I think I even had some, you know, what I really would suggest to people is they start with writing out their processes. They basically start with saying, what do I do now or what would I like to see everybody doing? How would I like to see everybody doing everything on the same page? And then go to RLM and match your stages and tasks with that process. It doesn't have to be rocket science. And you don't have to do what I do. And you don't have to do what somebody else does. But you have to do something that works for you. And it's important yep. to put it on paper and then train everybody in it. And, you know, documenting is just huge. Yeah. And I uh, want to give you a shout out. Marie Sherlock just put in the comments. Karen, your advice and, and RLM management, I'm going to change it to broadloom lead management tips, have been so helpful to our business over the last few months. Thank you. So you are helping a lot of people, and I appreciate that. And well, I'm happy I'm excited, to do it. Uh, and I'm excited to, to be there with you at FloorCon. Hopefully, you get a chance to relax, although I can imagine you by the pool on your phone looking at lead management seeing the team you know i don't plan to relax when i'm at those conferences t necessarily it's all business but i'll get other times to relax so. well the good news is this conference you're not going to be you know petting and touching beige carpet samples which is a whole other story and i don't want to ruin my talk but getting new beige <laughs> carpet samples is not going to your business yeah exactly yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Karen, I've taken up a lot of your time. I really appreciate it. I know everyone here really appreciates it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in person November 14th and 16th in Tucson, Arizona. Okay, great. We're excited. Awesome. Thank you so much.